morning. This morning we have uh, Dr. DeAngelis from her lab is going to be presenting a talk entitled Identifying Pathways Using Genetic Risk Factors and Their Modifiers to Develop Appropriate Targets for Therapies and Prevention of AMD. So without further ado, Dr. DeAngelis, thanks. Thank you for having me today. Thanks for having me today. And I want you to feel free to ask questions. Some of this may be a review for some of you, but I'm also going to present brand new data today that hopefully we'll have published within the next couple of months. So as most of you may know, age-related macular degeneration is the leading cause of blindness in this country as well as other developed countries. And it's expected to surpass diabetic eye disease and glaucoma combined within the next 20 years. Um, what am I doing wrong here? Yes, <laughs> okay. There we go. And the important thing to appreciate is the disease heterogeneity with this. And another thing to appreciate is with genetic studies or any disease, any disease of complex etiology that is more than one gene associated with the disease, like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, or cancer, or neurological diseases like schizophrenia and autism, is to have really good phenotyping. So to work with really good clinicians. And we happen to have that here at the Moran Eye Center. And most people use the age-related re eye disease scale, at least we do anyways for the AMD Gene Consortium sponsored by the National Institute of Health. And this is just showing the grades that we use anyways, you may use something different in the clinic here, but the early intermediate um, categories two and three, and the advanced geographic atrophy, which is less frequent than the neovascular form, the more severe form causing blindness. Most um, therapies right now are directed against this form, but as you know, they're limited, their applicability, and don't reverse blindness over the long term. And they're broad and not very um, appropriate or direct. And that's what we'd like to use with our genetics and our therapies is to make them more streamlined over the long term. Um, there's been many epidemiological factors associated with age-related macular degeneration, as you can see here. The most consistent from study to study is cigarette smoking, although many of these factors have been associated with age-related macular degeneration over the last 20 years or so. Um, evidence for genetic risk component comes from studies of families, and as with any complex disease, um, we know this because diseases such as this, like cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cluster in families, where when you have a first degree relative in the example of age-related macular degeneration, now they're putting your risk at six to 12 fold if you have a parent or a sibling with this disease. And twin studies show that concordance rate is greater for an identical twin than a fraternal twin. Now, many studies have shown either through candidate gene, genome-wide association studies, or linkage studies that there's been several genes. They haven't been consistently associated from study to study. The most consistent are the ARMS2H tra locus on chromosome 10, for which the function is not known and the complement factor H on chromosome 1, for which the function has been well established. Two genes I'm going to focus on today that our lab discovered is the Robo-1 and the Rora gene, and we believe that they function along with this ARMS2-H-TRA-1. 
We have a paper coming out from the AMD Gene Consortium. The embargo date is March 3rd, showing seven new loci on 60,000 individuals. And that no, it's none of these genes here, and those remain to be vetted in the function determined. So there's still more work to be done in terms of function and whatnot in this field. Now, have the strongest loci been identified? Likely so, the ARMS2 and HTRA1 gene. But this always doesn't tell us about the missing heritability, specifically the gene-gene interactions. And I'm going to show you some examples of that today that we've published on and we're going to be publishing on in the next couple of months and some new methodological approaches to uncover that in disease pathophysiology and uncovering those pathways. And there's examples of this with Alzheimer's disease and even cholesterol metabolism. A great example of this is the HMG co-reductase gene where variation in that gene is only responsible for changing cholesterol levels just a very small amount, just a fraction, but that's what most of the cholesterol-lowering drugs are geared against. So just because you find variation in it may not be responsible for a large effect, a modifier gene may be a great therapeutic target for disease. <coughs> Now, in a complex disease, we can't just consider one gene. We need to consider groups of genes. And we need to consider more than one level, not just the DNA, but RNA and protein. And we need to consider the environment to get to mechanism and hence pathways of genes. And an example of a genetic approach, this is a review for some of you, that we use for our discovery cohort and has proved successful for us is using a pat is using a family-based approach. Because this is an aging disease, we usually don't have children available because they're too young to manifest the disease. And so we've used a SID pair-based approach. And I started this back when I was a postdoc in Boston years ago, back in 2000, 1999. And we collected SID pairs, extremely discordant SID pairs, where one had an individual, the proban, had the worst form of the disease, who had a sibling who had no form of the disease and was older than the individual who had the disease. And we s looked for levels of gene expression as well as DNA that were different between the two individuals and that were the same. And they were always already matched for race and ethnicity, so you didn't have confounding factors that could lead to false positives in analysis. This is an example of one of our extremely discordant SID pairs. And I have to say the success of this is really due in large part to Joan Miller and Ivana Kim, at Mass who are still at Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. And this is actually a fraternal pair and unfortunately, this pair was one of the first pair recruited and they're long deceased. But this is an end stage discoform scarring and this is his brother. And of note, the brother, even though they're fraternal, is slightly at an age slightly older. But as we can visualize with these fundus photos, there's no observable drusen in this fundus photo and the maculae or, or, or normal here. One of our first approaches with this set of extremely discordant SID pairs, and now we have well over 500 of these SID pairs, and this is our discovery cohort. And you'll find with any genetic study that replication is important on, is on different ethnicities and many different case control sets. But we use a family set as our discovery. And one thing we wanted to make sure is that each pair, when we used our approach, 
Um, we used lymphoblastoid cell lines because we wanted to use our living, breathing patients, and this was a way to access tissue, if you will, and we tried blood samples, but we had a lot of noise associated with the analysis because we didn't want our patients fasting. But we wanted to make sure they were matched for certain epidemiological factors that could affect um, the end result, that could affect gene expression levels. And what we found is after cleaning up the data, doing principal component analysis, and doing several different statistical approaches, and this was done in conjunction with Urgot from Rockefeller University. We've got a set of genes that we thought could function together in a pathway. And gene expression analysis, the results of the genes, could infer some functionality. And what you see here in green are genes that are decreased at least twofold between an affected sibling or the proband compared to their unaffected sibling. Moreover, we had linkage data from our lab and other people who work in the field of age-related macular degeneration as well as some genome-wide association studies. And you can sort it out by its gene name as well as its location to infer some functionality. And some of these genes you see here, I'm going to focus on Robonora first because we have that published. And some of these genes you see here is new data that I'm going to present today that we will hopefully get published very soon that we also have functional data to support. You can also use some specialized software that we have available here at the Moran to help to visualize the way its ingenuity pathway analysis to weigh these, to weigh, bleh, to visualize the way these genes might function together or the way they interconnect because we don't know a lot about the pathways or the hypothetical pathways in our genome. We only know about our classical pathways. And you can see that VEGF is in this pathway, the low density lipoprotein is in this pathway, and this could be one pathway or several pathways or networks that overlap. Now remember, this is all at the RNA level. We need to corroborate this or validate this at another level, either at the protein level or the DNA level. And we chose to validate this and move further at the DNA level. And the ones that are in color are the ones we picked up from our microarray experiments. And this is just from the literature, and these are additional genes that may function together with our microarray genes. And this pathway may function differently or be less robust in a person with AMD than a person who doesn't get AMD. Another thing the ingenuity pathway analysis does is it ranks possible pathways that your sets of genes can function together and be involved in. And the significance of these pathways is the inverse of the p-value or the log of the p-value along here on the x-axis, and the y-axis is these um, functional pathways. And as you can see, lipid metabolism, cardiovascular disease, not surprisingly, functions that have already been implicated and well-published in associated with age-related macular degeneration, in, including immunological disease or the CFH gene. But the take-home message here is, is that many of these genes have more than one function, and many of these genes share the same function. So this underscores the redundancy of the human genome and that looking, the importance of looking at sets of genes and not one gene in isolation. When you think about designing preventative and therapies for any complex disease, not just age-related macular degeneration. So as I said before, we wanted to look at the DNA level. 
so one approach is when you look at these sets of genes, a uh, uh, way to do it is to, you wa don't want to look at every known single nucleotide polymorphism or the difference in DNA between individuals. And these exist in our genome quite frequently. You want to look at what's called tagging SNPs. And these tag for numerous variation in our genome, but they encompass they can encompass entire variation within a gene. And they're an economical and resourceful approach to look at an entire gene within your cohort. And that's what we did. And then you can drill down further to try to pinpoint um, a disease causal single nucleotide polymorphism. In order to do that, we, want, we again wanted to look at our extensive SID pair SID that because remember we only looked at nine SID pairs to get our microarray data. So we wanted to look at our entire pair of 500 siblings and then try to replicate this in our Greek cohort as well as a cohort from Dr. Deborah Schomburg in Boston which is prospectively based. And what we found is that we had a haplotype or a couple of SNPs that are inherited together that we could replicate in this cohort. And we published on this data. I apologize if I'm glossing over anything, but I can follow up with questions later. And this is just showing we replicated this in three different cohorts. Furthermore, we were able within that pathway to replicate that these genes were actually interacting mathematically, statistically, that Robo and Laura interacted. And moreover, we were able not only to show that in, a gr in our SID pairs, but we were able to replicate it in Deborah Schomburg's population as well as the Greek cohort. And moreover, we were able to show this, that these two genes did in fact bind via chromatin immunoprecipitation in a mouse model. And hence, that was recently published. Now, since that work was done, we pursued this further. And we said, is this just relegated, is, are we just seeing this only in Caucasians? Because if something's truly going to be a therapeutic target and have global applicability, we should be able to see this possibly in other ethnicities. Well, lo and behold, with our collaborators, Dr. Park in Korea, we have a set of siblings, uh, not siblings, sorry, unrelated case controls that are well phenotyped from South Korea of almost 1,500 individuals. And while Rora is just relegated or just specific to Caucasians, Robo can be seen to be significant in the Koreans in an Asian population. But more importantly, and this is a test of true association, the SNP, the same SNP, is more significant in meta-analysis. So that's combining all your individuals. And that's a true test of association. So once we saw that, we said, let's test the rest of these genes and the tagging SNPs within them. So we said not only are we going to test them for individual association, but because of the robo rura interaction, let's also check for epistasis. Now obviously, because Rora was not significant in the Koreans, we could not replicate the robo rura interaction that we saw in the Caucasians. Epistasis, the definition is testing for interaction. This is also probably responsible for a lot of the misinheritability. 
There's a series right now, if you're interested in looking more into what is missing heritability, it's not just due to the rare variation. You've seen a lot of focus on exome sequencing. It's also due to this gene-gene interaction. And Eric Lander has a series right now in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, a series of review articles on missing heritability. I encourage you to look at it. It started last year. It's going into this year on this exact topic. A way to approach it in looking at gene-gene interaction is not just to look at cases and controls, because a lot of gene-gene interaction is going to be, a, is going to look at modifiers. I already told you, for a disease like age-related macular degeneration, we probably found the biggest genes that have the largest effect, CFH, ARMS2, and HTROM1. So the things we're finding are likely the modifier genes, the genes in the pathway. So we need things that are going to search for things, genes, or variants that aren't going to have large effect. And the controls are likely going to dilute that frequency or alleles there are actually going to be low. So this is an approach that's been used, but not a lot. So we took this approach with our cohorts. Now this slide is a little bit beastly, but the take home message here, this is in our discovery cohort of SIBs. And across the top here, you can see Aurora, the HTRA ARMS2, and the robust SNPs. These are the SNPs that have been published. These are the SNPs, the tagging SNPs, that are in those genes you saw in the pathway. The things to focus on here are just the yellow ones, because these are the ones that would hold up under multiple testing. It is very important that you control for multiple testing, because you're going to find significance if you run enough tests. The blanks mean there was no interaction. And you see things that look slightly significant, but they're not going to hold up under multiple testing. This is the discovery cohort. When we pull the interaction, and notice we were able to include the Koreans, the Asian cohort here, and this is after controlling for multiple testing, we have very significant p-values. And this helps to validate that pathway that you've seen. And we see significant interaction with Robo, Lura, HTRA, this RPSKA2, ABCA1, which functions in lipid metabolism, and just a few of these genes. Not all of these genes are functioning together. And the thing also, take home message here too, it's for all subtypes of AMD. There's nothing more significant when we look at just neovascular AMD. And this is just a summary, and this is showing that there's a handful of genes, Roborore and ABCA1, that are downregulated in RGS13 and RPSK that are upregulated in the affected patients versus the unaffected sibling. And we can try to think about disease mechanism, and that's what we're testing right now through comatin immunoprecipitation assays as well as epigenetic assays that we're doing. And in fact, these are the results. This is only one SIB pair I'm showing here, or some of our chromatin immunoprecipitation assay. And what I'm just showing here is that RORA, a Robo, and HTRA are binding to the RORA antibody. In, so this is validating our statistical interactions at the chromatin immunoprecipitation assay. And this is just one example. It's not showing any difference between a normal individual and a patient with neovascular AMD. But we're doing a larger cohort. I don't have all the data here to see if there's significance between those with AMD and those without AMD. CFH is the negative control because we don't expect complement factor H to function in this pathway. And then RORA we expect to be 
similar to CFH. Now, another thing we wanted to do is what do we see at the protein level? What do we see with Robo and Rora in the different subtypes of AMD when we measure? Because another thing is, is this disease, age-related macular degeneration, is it localized? Is it systemic? So what do we see serum-wise? Well, lo and behold, we don't see anything. And this is, we happen to have serums only for our SID pairs. And when we look at the subtypes all together, A and D as a whole, or separately compared to normals, we don't see anything significant. However, when we parcel out looking at a disease SNP, this is a beautiful example of interaction. When we see, when we look at people who have this SNP, in particular in Rora, they have their serum levels get lower than those who are normal. So we see an interaction for people who, who have the G-SNP, they have lower serum levels. So this is an example of interaction. And we're actually doing something similar with Bala and Bobby's lab with GLIT-1. And we're trying to validate that right now. Another thing we can do with the ingenuity pathway analysis is go in a little further and see how Rora and Robo look work together. And what we found is that Robo and Rora supposedly work to function to for try to out to control triglyceride levels as well as levels of lipids because we're trying to figure out how they also work just besides with genes because if they supposedly function in lipid metabolism which was your number one function on that other chart where I showed you biologically how do they do it well supposedly through lipids and try like triglycerides and LDL so we wanted to look at other serum biomarkers besides the genes themselves when we looked at cytokines, sile adhesion molecules, and lipoid proteins, after controlling for the multiple testing, only the triglycerides, which we found protective for a slight elevation of triglycerides, was found to be protective compared to the A and D patients. Again, the literature goes both ways in age-related the macular degeneration. So with um, Nick Bazan from LSU, who's one of my former mentors, we're trying to suss out what the different lipoproteins are in the triglycerides here, because this is a bit bizarre. And again, the literature is controversial with what's in there from an epidemiological. This is just a review of some of the literature with the evidence for in the epidemiological studies with the serum and the reports. But there have been genes associated with lipid metabolism, cardiovascular disease besides the genes we've reported and, and others have reported. And is this a potential therapeutic po um, pathway? Possibly, but we need to get further in the mechanism. And right now we're trying to finish up the chromatin immunoprecipitation studies. And working with Dr. Amy Hartnett here at the Moran, we're also doing some immunocytochemistry on some fresh eye tissue to try to localize the expression of robo and rura between age-related macular degeneration eyes versus normal A and D eyes in the RPE and in the retina too, to try to see where that expression is. And we try to put together, because we don't know if this is a systemic or localized disease, but you have to appreciate you've got all these genes, you've got heredity, you've got environmental factors like smoking, 
you've got the triglycerides, but you've also got this like Rura gene interaction and you've got aging going on and how this affects the eye and the system, we've got to put the story together and we're trying to put this all together to get the sequelae of mechanism of disease because this happens over time and how to put the gene and the environment together to bring on disease is, is putting the story together, not just focusing on one gene. And we couldn't do this without our wonderful collaborators, my laboratory here, Dr. Hartnett, people from Boston, um, Deborah Schomburg, Nina Hadar, Ivana and Joan, people in Boston, Juliana Silvestri from Queens University, Maria and Ava from University of Thessaly, the Greek cohort, and Dr. Park from Seoul University. And this is a picture of my lab, Margot Morrison, who did all the statistics, and Roseanne, who does a lot of the functional work, Denise, Katrina, Katie, and Caitlin. And nothing would be done without this generous funding, especially from the unrestricted grant from here at the Moran. So thank you, and I'm open for questions. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that, that's a great question. I, none of these cohorts I know have pseudodrusin that these cohorts I study, but that would be a great thing to do. <laughs> okay. It, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How prevalent is pseudodrusin in a given normal population, would you say? Do you know? I will, I will tell you these normals were followed for 10 years. So this, this is a family I followed for 10 years and he, I followed him up after 10 years and he was still normal, no neovascular after 10 years. So. So how fast do they go? Well, this came from the, the Yeah.
that's one of the reasons too when we looked when we did the interaction we only looked at kids like I didn't play the game anymore so we a lot of what we did for the staff I only looked at the kids in general and had really good conversations I didn't play the game anymore and look at, to look at the math problems and stuff and a lot of the study will stop her coming up but I was thinking it would be small for some We have 60,000 people, so God knows we have got so many years, generational years, that are contributing. There is no way they know what we're going to get in 10 years. So there are human needs that God has given. There's our human needs, but in human needs, God has given us a lot of strategies. Is that, oh, we have these great numbers, so we can buy you, but they're going to miss a lot of things. Absolutely, I agree with you. And that's what this next study was actually in kids that they talked about that was there. Yeah, so I played that too during the uh, Super Bowl five in the first game. It's not, it's not possible to play the game that we did in the last year. And the second game was especially the first six, seven, and nine years. I mean, it's the time when you get to the hill track where you can learn something so much about the game. So hopefully the science will come out. But they have some really exciting Is there a potential, too, on that field where you can have oh, no. a No, because some people are your, like, soccer parents, you know, or the people in Asia who are your power kid kid, you know? <laughs> so you have... Well, I don't think anybody would know how special Phoenix is. Mm -hmm. I mean, most people would view it as something different. Mm -hmm. I mean, Greg and Jim, who owns the, you know, the flop office that you see, you can see mm -hmm. that you've got, you've got Well, I think that's painting a different broad brush. That's this program, <laughs> when we got it, we put the roof on it, but there was a general idea that it was going to be done in six months. Mm -hmm. Did you want to make some comments? Hmm? Sure. And it's I, be, I believe so. <laughs> Here, Paul, do you want this? I'm not going to show this picture. Well, you're right. Um, so that 
actually dealt with that. Actually, I had to deal with that last fall. <laughs> they presented that. And actually, we dealt with that and we factored that in. And that was still a significant asset, too. So it was just. We actually have that, but again, it's self report. So the way we consider meds is they have to have taken it at least twice a week for um, six months. And it, but it's self-report. It's not prospective. But a good question. <laughs> we, I don't, I haven't looked at the aversion here. I don't have access to this population. But we look at secondary smoke, too. Like, have you grown up in a household where somebody has smoked? It would be good if somebody would look at the inversion. We've looked at where people have lived most of their lifetime and factor that in. But um, it would be good to take it in. We published a paper back in 2011 where we looked at where people live the latitude and longitude for most of their lifetime. We actually didn't come out on that one. <laughs> I can't comment on that. <laughs> so, all good questions. But it is, it's hard measuring brain volume. We try to quantitate based on what it can be. So, thank you. Uh, you're a sweetie. Thanks for coming.